Okay, well, it's uh, 401. And first of all, thank you all for coming. And uh, this is the penultimate presentation of this semester of the Penn State CTSI BIRD Biostats Epidemiology Research Design Seminar Series. And uh, I'll go through a few of the ground rules first. Um, first of all, uh, this is coordinated by a small team, uh, Lan Kong, Professor, myself, Terry Murphy. I apologize, uh, my camera is not working today. Um, and Jay Zhu, an associate professor who, who also hosts this. Um, here was the schedule of talks that we've had uh, across the fall. Today, uh, second row from the bottom, uh, we're very fortunate to have Dr. David Major, and he'll be talking to us about the role of data coordinating center in multi-center clinical trials. This Zoom session is being recorded automatically, and I did remember to turn recording back on, Jay. Um, please mute your microphone uh, when our speaker is presenting. You can submit questions in the chat box uh, during the lecture and uh, after the speaker has finished and he opens up the floor to questions, you may then use your microphone and the camera. If you are registered for this, you will receive the slides, a link to this recording, and uh, the chance to provide feedback after the seminar, which would be very helpful to us. So again, I'm very pleased to present to you Professor Dave Major. Um, he's a professor in the Division of Biostatistics and Bioinformatics in the Department of Public Health Sciences. Uh, Dr. Major did all of his uh, university work at the Great University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Uh, he studied biology and psychology first and stayed there for a master's in biostatistics and then a PhD in biostatistics. He came to uh, Penn State College of Medicine right in 1995, and he has been with us ever since. He teaches survival analysis in the, bio, in the PhD program in biostats, and his research focuses on multi-center clinical research. He has been the PI for eight NIH-funded data coordination centers that support clinical trials and longitudinal studies that are related in content to asthma and childhood wheezing. And so I took a quick look in PubMed and Dr. Major has over 200 publications under his belt and a, a large proportion of these are in the very top notch uh, respiratory journals, the pulmonology journals. I have worked with pulmonologists uh, from day one, but almost always in the realm of critical care. Pulmonologists kind of serve two functions. They take care of critically ill patients, and uh, Dr. Major is, has worked with them almost entirely in the realm of respiratory function. These skills that he brings us are extremely valuable. These uh, data coordinating center grants bring in tens of millions of dollars routinely. So while the title of this uh, may not sound exactly exciting, it is super important work that guarantees the integrity and the quality of the data in large clinical trials. And there, there are I'd wager there are very few people in the country, if not the world, with the amount of experience with this, this special talent. And so we're very fortunate to have Dr. Major. And Dave, I'll hand it off to you and uh, enjoy your presentation. Great. Well, thank you very much, Terry, for that kind introduction. <clears throat> um, and saving me time on giving my background. Um, so I'll jump right into it. <clears throat> yes, data coordinating centers have become where I've made my career. Um, this is going to be a sort of a lessons learned sort of presentation. Um, 
and I will start my share screen. <clears throat> You're seeing the slides and the pointer, is that right? Yes, sir. Great, thanks so much. Um, <clears throat> I think this is the same title slide that you'd shown. So my timeline <clears throat> um, goes back to 1995 here at Penn State. This graph doesn't go quite that far back, but my first involvement in data coordinating centers was in, um, the late 90s um, with respect to childhood asthma of something called the Childhood Asthma Research uh, Network, which would do uh, eight, eight clinical trials. Um, that spawned uh, another large research network um, that did 10 more trials. That started in the late 2000s and went for um, close to 10 years. Um, I then moved into uh, a longitudinal, rather than a randomized clinical trial, longitudinal study, um, which has been going for 10 years, also in severe asthma. Um, but what I'm gonna talk about today, which has proved to be a very interesting study and where I've learned some of my lessons is, has to do with primary prevention of um, childhood wheezing. Um, we're also working on a primary prevention trial of asthma. Right now, of course, we're here in the end of 2023. So these three grants are all still ongoing. Um, we're also working on a genotype and dupilumab response trial. And um, with LAN, um, we're just beginning a primary care um, asthma um, project, which will go for another five or six years. So as a biostatistician, I was trained in statistical methodology, mainly um, clinical trial design, other types of design, analyses, and so forth. Um, but data coordinating centers do a lot more than that. And I'm just going to give you a quick sort of list of things that mostly um, you know, describe what it is responsible for. And in green here, I'm listing things that um, I was trained to do. So partnering with clinicians to select and design rigorous studies is actually why I got into biostatistics in the first place. As Terry mentioned, my undergraduate work was actually in psychology and biology, and I had intended to go to medical school until I um, did some volunteer work at the local hospital, I was told that if you wanted to apply to medical school, it looked good to do some volunteer work. And I realized very quickly that I do not like dealing with sick people. I would have made a very poor doctor, uh, horrible bedside manner. So um, I, my brother is a physician, my father a physician, which is probably why I thought I should get into it, but um, it was, I would have been a horrible doctor. So I got into um, biostatistics. And providing statistical leadership is another aspect of coordinating trials that I'm feeling very comfortable with. Some of the other things that we do, though, are not things that I was trained to do, such as um, you know, getting into the details of data acquisition, electronic health records, laboratories, um, devices. Um, those are things that I've been learning about, um, and they, they mesh with my training, but um, not something I was really ready for. Data integration and data harmonization is something that I was trained for. However, there are things that I was not trained for and I'm not sure that I even really like doing. So for example, planning and conducting site training and monitoring visits. Um, that has really nothing to do with biostatistics, um, but it has a lot to do with management and making sure things go right. And that's what data coordinating centers are largely um, there for. We also get into managing regulatory aspects, um, including reports to the FDA, um, study sponsors, other regulatory agencies, um, facilitating and participating in communication amongst researchers, um, managing study logistics, including um, capitation awards, that is following the money around, writing checks and so forth, and maintaining standardization quality control across sites. So you can see here that only three of these 10 things are something that I was trained to do as a biostatistician. Um, and uh, four of the 10 things are, are things that I had never imagined that I would get into. So that's where I've learned a lot of my lessons. I'll talk about funding a data coordinating center. So <clears throat> grant awards are typically five to seven years. Um, they're awarded one year at a time. And I'm for some of you, I may be talking about things that you're familiar with um, very acutely yourself. Um, and some of you may not know a lot about how these large grant work. So I'm, I'm gonna talk a little bit about it. And, um, and maybe some of you can um, sympathize with me and some of the difficulties that come up. 
So if a project's not complete at the end of the grant period, the investigators can continue the project under what's called a no cost extension or an NCE, which means that no new money is awarded. When you say you get something like a no cost extension, that maybe sort of sounds nice. Um, the issue though, is that it doesn't cost the federal government any, anything. Uh, the money has to come from somewhere. Um, so no cost extension um, isn't really um, a great thing. So if a grant isn't finished in its, in its allotted period, um, no cost extensions are, are you know, granted one year at a time. And a first year no cost extension is generally automatic. A second year no cost extension <clears throat> typically requires approval by a program officer and those are routinely granted. A third no cost extension, now we're getting into something that's gonna require division or institute level approval, which can be obtained if there's a strong justification. Fourth year, no cost extensions don't exist. They will not give you those. So projects need to be finished um, no later than three years after the end of a grant. So how do we operate a DCC in a no cost extension? As I just said, no cost extension means that the government isn't paying for anything. It doesn't mean that it doesn't actually cost anything. So generally DCCs cost somewhere between 250 and 750,000 uh, per year to operate. Um, <clears throat> university is not going to absorb those costs during an NCE. So the DCC has got to come up with that money from somewhere. <clears throat> um, and what has become sort of the, the way to do that, uh, which isn't sort of the way we have to, the game that must be played with the NIH, is to essentially save up that money for, in advance um, when you know that an NCE is anticipated. So for example, and this is, a, this is going to match pretty well with what I show when I get to my um, my uh, a primary wheezing study, let's say it's a $5 million award for a five-year grant at a million dollars per year. So let's say in the first year, a million dollars is awarded, but only $800,000 is spent because things move more slowly than anticipated. Um, so there's $200,000 $200, that goes into the bank, and the NIH calls this an unobligated balance, meaning that they awarded a million dollars but the, the um, university only invoiced them for $800,000, so there's $200,000 left. <clears throat> Year two comes, they award a new $1 million. So that $200,000 is still sitting in the bank. A new $1 million is awarded, but let's say in my little example, only two fifty seven hundred fifty dollars is spent, um, leaving two hundred fifty dollars in the bank. So let's say we do eight hundred nine hundred dollars At the end of five years, we've got $850,000 in the bank. 200,000 in the first year and so forth. So <clears throat> under that scenario, um, the NIH has awarded the full $5 million within the five-year grant period, but there's $850,000 sitting there, not yet spent. DCC can request access to the bank to fund that work during the no-cost extension. So that's how these things <clears throat> in practice um, generally work. Now the NIH perspective on this is not quite the same. The NIH doesn't they're not required to keep unspent funds in the bank. Um, and in fact, they don't like to keep unspent, unspent funds in the bank. Um, they call these unobligated balances and those don't look good on their uh, balance sheets. <clears throat> the reason for that is because at the end of a grant, if any funds have not been spent, those go back to the US Treasury. So NIH doesn't keep those dollars. So if they give us a $5 million grant, we only spend $4.2 million of it. It's not like they can use that under 800,000 uh, for another project to support other research. It goes back to the US Treasury. Um, and I, probably a lot of people have feelings about how the US Treasury spends their money. So NIH really does not want to see grants finished without all the money being spent. So my little example had 750 sitting at the bank at the end of year four. NIH is going to be hesitant to award a new $1 million in year five, which is the last year of the grant, <clears throat> when there's you know, a sense that there's jeopardy of that money being lost if it's not finished. So they could, in fact, this has happened, they could choose to award only $250,000 in new money at that fifth year and also award $750,000 from the bank. So basically, they can drain your bank account out from under you, <clears throat> and in which case, at the end of that fifth year now, there's nothing in the bank. The reason they would do that is because that 750,000 that they didn't um, award as new money, they can then use that for some other project. So once, if they, if they um, keep things, they keep their books in good stead, 
by not awarding new money, but rather by taking it from the bank, um, then those funds can go to some other project. So if the NIH wants to use unspent funds from one grant to fund another, they have to do it before the first grant ends and before they've awarded those dollars. So is this really a problem? How often does this come up? <clears throat> well, as I mentioned, the first project I worked on was childhood asthma. That was a seven year grant, which in, at the end of the project needed two years of no cost extension. Um, in fact, that's happened in every single project. Um, the asthma across the ages went for a full three years, no cost extension. The severe asthma one actually had a no, two year no cost extension in the middle and another two year no cost extension is anticipated at the end. Right now we're already almost here to the end of the uh, funding period. And the primary prevention asthma study um, is problematic because we're already here um, coming to the end of our third year no cost extension and obviously the project's not done. So uh, what are we gonna do about that? So this is the study called ORBEX. ORBEX stands for Oral Bacterial Extracts for the Prevention of Wheezing, Lower Respiratory Tract Illnesses. Um, so 7 million American children have asthma, 200,000 hospitalizations and 300 deaths per year. There's no proven prevention therapies and no cures for asthma. So most children with persistent moderate to, mild, moderate to severe asthma are gonna have that disease for the rest of their life. Now there is mild childhood asthma that, that sometimes can be outgrown, um, but children with persistent moderate asthma are likely to um, are likely to have to deal with that um, forever. So most cases of persistent childhood asthma start in the first three years of life, um, manifesting early on as wheezing lower respiratory illnesses. So upper respiratory illnesses are things like sniffles um, <clears throat> and light coughs and things like that. Lower respiratory illnesses are down lower. Um, uh, in the chest and get into problematic um, uh, problematic for little kids. There's something called the atopic march. And for those I saw Neil Thomas on here, there may be other positions as well. Please forgive anything I'm saying and oversimplifying things for the biostatistician's perspective. Um, hopefully the, th the ideas are at least correct, even if the details are off. So the idea behind the atopic march is that um, healthy young children, like all children, are going to be exposed to various viral infections at some points during their life, and they're going to catch colds, um, maybe very bad, which would be upper respiratory illnesses, or very bad colds, which could be lower respiratory illnesses. But healthy children generally um, come through those, um, you know, in relatively short periods of time, a couple of weeks, um, and they're, you know, they never have problems with them again. Predisposed um, infants or young children. Um, are ones who have some sort of underlying allergic inflammation or some impaired um, epithelial burial function or some impaired antiviral response. They <clears throat> suffer, they, they come into contact with these same viruses, get the same sort of infections as, as healthy kids do. Those are more likely to, though, to develop into the more serious lower respiratory illnesses, which can result in airway damage, airway remodeling, that is physical damage to the um, to the lungs themselves, which is not repairable, um, develops into recurrent wheezing and later on to full-blown um, asthma. Um, <clears throat> just earlier this month, there was a story about this. Um, doctors in Pennsylvania sounding warnings about RSV threats to babies and young children, putting them in the hospital. Those are the kinds of things that, um, you know, those children who are in the hospital more than once, twice, three times, um, are, are gonna be at very high risk for developing asthma later in life. So, you know, what can we do about this? <clears throat> Epidemiology has shown that environments which increase early microbial exposure tend to be protective against WLRIs, um, early atopy and asthma. And the evidence also indicates that microbial exposure can modulate innate immune responses in early life, and sometimes called the hygiene hypothesis. And the idea that kids who grow up on farms and are exposed to dirt and other things like that um, end up being um, you know, less at risk for asthma and other um, <clears throat> problems of that sort. So you know, there's um, parenting advice that includes letting your kids play in the dirt, so to speak, or roll on the floor with the dogs. 
um, and the idea that that's actually good for you um, or good for children is this idea behind the hygiene hypothesis. Keeping things too clean um, is actually is actually bad for you. So the, the five second rule on food that gets dropped in the dirt may be too short. Maybe we should let that go for 30 seconds or a minute and then still eat it. <laughs> but the specific microbes responsible for that protection are, are being actively investigated. But even if we figure out which ones those are, finding some way to synthetically manufacture those into compounds that could be used as drugs in young children is going to be, cumbers be cumbersome and, and may not be possible. So what does this mean? Um, well, maybe we ought to do a study where we randomize children to play in the dirt for a couple hours every day. Um, that's going to be impractical. There's something that's been used in Europe for many years that's called um, um, bronchovaxone, which is an oral lyophilized detoxified extract of eight pathological bacteria. Um, it's been used, as I said, empirically in Europe for the prevention of respiratory illnesses. Um, however, it hasn't been researched very rigorously at all. In fact, when this project was first presented um, to the um, asthma community as a potential trial for preventing wheezing, um, they call it bronco voodoo rather than bronco vaxum. So we don't know if this could really possibly work, um, but it's definitely shown to be safe in children as young as six months of age. So what does this mean? Well, actually what they're doing is they're taking live microbes, bacteria, um, freeze drying them, hydrating them, mixing them up, um, and then turning them into drugs and, and vaccines and, and um, things like that. So that's what an oral bacterial extract is. Um, basically, they're taking the microbes in the dirt, in the animals, um, wherever they would be coming from, and turning them into a medicine. So rather than having to get outside and, and play with the animals, um, you can just get the bacteria through, the, um, through, a, through a pill. <laughs> So how is this going to work? Well, the idea is that if this will prevent um, lower respiratory tract illnesses, then we can cut off this um, um, cut off this pathway and potentially, um, you know, at least immediately prevent recurrent wheezing, um, which could be prevention of asthma. So if this works, this would be you know really um, a huge huge progress. So this study specifically is to evaluate if bronchobaxin given to high-risk infants for 10 days monthly for two consecutive years um, can delay the occurrence of the first WLRI, that's wheezing lower respiratory illness um, during a third year observation of study. So we're gonna, uh, two years, these children are gonna be um, exposed to this bronchobaxin, these, these dead bacteria, um, and then see if afterwards that will, that will, um, uh, provide some sort of immunity to them. You could almost think of this as like a, a, a vaccine um, in that you know exposure to something in advance will generate immunity to something later on. So that's the idea uh, with the study. So the basic schematic is that children are randomized in a one-to-one -one fashion, either to two years of treatment with bronchobaxim or two years of treatment with placebo <clears throat> that ends and then they're followed for another year without any treatment at all to, to see whether or not there's any WLRI, wheezing lower respiratory tract illnesses. And ideally, there will be very few in the bronchobaxim group as compared to the placebo group. And if that were to work, if we were to show that bronchobaxim could um, <clears throat> reduce or even eliminate uh, wheezing lower respiratory tract illnesses, there would be a chance then that that's a pathway towards uh, preventing asthma. So the power, <clears throat> power curves for this study, excuse me. <clears throat> look like this. So <clears throat> I'm showing power on the um, y-axis here. <clears throat> the gray line here is representing what's being targeted in this particular study. So this particular study is targeted for 85% um, power to, defect in, to detect an effect size of a hazard ratio for bronchobaxim compared to placebo of about 66%. That means we're, we're hoping to reduce the risk of wheezing, <clears throat> wheezing lower respiratory tract illnesses by 33%, hazard ratio 66% uh, or 66, 0 0.66. 
Now, the power of that study depends partially on the sample size and partially on the risk in the placebo group. So if the risk in the placebo group is, <clears throat> is very high, as depicted by the pink line here, the power for the effect size we're looking at could be as high as you know, closer to 90%. If the <clears throat> risk in the placebo group is very low, um, in this case, 0 0.35, um, the power will be much lower. So if we ended up studying kids who are at who in fact are at low risk or lower than anticipated risk of having the events, um, it's gonna be more difficult to show an effect. So hazard rate here means roughly <clears throat> that we would anticipate 0 0.35 WLRIs per child year in the study. So each child has roughly a 35% you know, chance of having um, one or more WLRIs um, during the study period. That was our conservative, you know, sort of low estimate, and our optimistic estimate was that it would be 50%, uh, um, you know, or a rate of 0.5 WLRI events per child year. Um, and what we're targeting is 0 0.43, and that's based on something called the Tucson Children's Respiratory Study, which is a very large study of um, young children who were followed for, they're currently actually following them into their 20s. Um, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> and they had observed a, a WLRI rate of 0 0.43. So could this study work? <clears throat> well, it's gonna take six months to get the study started, 24 months to completely recruit 926 children. So we're already now there at 30 months. 36 months from last patient in to last patient out, there's 24 months of treatment, two years, plus 12 months um, off treatment to finish follow-up. And then six months for closeout and analysis. <clears throat> so that's 72 months <clears throat> right there is greater than five years. So before we even started the study, we know it can't be completed within the grant period of five years. So a best case scenario is a full um, one year no cost extension. Very likely we're gonna need two no cost extensions for that project. <clears throat> so back to my... <clears throat> Back to my lessons learned about how do we actually make this work. We we know or we knew going into this that we were not going to be able to finish it in the funding period. We knew we needed to save money. So the grant has to have a five-year budget. NIH will not ex accept a six-year budget for a five-year grant. <clears throat> the total award in this case was actually 4.9 million, not a nice round number, but it was close to the 5 million I used in my example. So we're gonna need a six year, what I'll call a shadow budget. That is, we need to have a working budget that's gonna take six years um, that will allow us to bank money during the first five years to fund that no cost extension. So how are we gonna do that? <clears throat> well, I showed you an example before where you could chip in a couple hundred thousand dollars per year for the first five years and have uh, enough money left for a sixth year. But I also noted that the NIH does not like to see those large unobligated balances building up um, in their grants. So we can't let that bank get too big in the early years. Um, and we also have to submit a budget that's gonna be credible. So for example, what I can't do is submit a budget that's $800,000 per year for the first four years, so that basically all the money gets spent, and then $1.7 million in the fifth year so that we have the bank um, completely filled in the fifth year. That's not a credible budget. What I mean by that is that the grants managers <clears throat> are not gonna look at that budget and say, that makes sense for your project. Your project, the way you've described this project, which is a five-year project, um, that, that budgeting doesn't make any sense. That's not a credible award. So we worked with the NIH semi-officially. Um, this was the first time I'd done this, um, to actually work with the NIH grants office to come up with a budget that wasn't the real budget. Um, and it was a unique experience. Um, uh, and I was surprised actually how helpful they were um, with doing this. Usually um, NIH and federal government employees don't like to um, help you skirt the rules. Um, now, as I said, skirting the rules is maybe pushing this a little bit far, but um, we were definitely coming up with a budget that um, was not what was being officially submitted. What we came up with was this budget here. So we needed to make it look like something close to a million dollars per year, um, but not exactly a million dollars per year. And we were expecting to bank from that roughly 100,000 in the first year, 100,000 in the second year, 
um, and so forth to get to the $850,000 left over at the end of year five. And the idea was that by the time the bean counters, for lack of a better word, noticed that big $350,000 bolus in year five, um, we're already going to have access to that as a no-cost extension. The government moves slowly, as we all know. So by the time <clears throat> by the time that big obligated balance was noticed, we would have already gotten it requested um, access to it and um, be able to do the work. So we would avoid that problem of the NIH sort of taking that money back um, um, before we got there. So <clears throat> That's just for the $5 million DCC budget. There's also a $20 million budget for this project, which the DCC uh, is involved in um, processing. $20 million meaning all the dollars that need to go out to pay for the actual patient care, um, the treatments the children are gonna get, all of the clinic visits that they're gonna do, all of the staff that needs to be out there at the various clinical centers to do the work. Um, we had to do the same sort of thing there with the $20 million. So we got that through. Um, project began, and let's skip ahead to January of 2020. The project actually started recruiting in January of 2017. So by January 2020, the first children in, that is the children who were who were randomized in early 2017, had finished their two years of treatment um, by early 2019, and had finished their first year of follow-up by January 2020. So they were just starting to come out. <clears throat> this is what our accrual report looked like. So accrual here on the y-axis is the total number of children who were randomized. The blue line here is what the goal had been. Um, remember I told you we were going to do all our recruiting in roughly um, two years, a little bit less. <clears throat> and um, we obviously we weren't making that. The black line is what we actually did. So it became pretty clear early on that we were not going to make that goal. So the NIH allowed us to develop a new goal. So that was established in June 2019 this red line, which would get us out to our 926, somewhere out here. <clears throat> uh, so this was as of January 13th, 2020. This is, this is a, sort of an old snapshot of what that looked like. So you can see that already at this point, we had added a second no-cost extension, and we'd squeezed our analysis time in half. So we already at this point knew um, that the one no-cost extension wasn't going to do it. We were going to need two no-cost extensions. Um, so all our planning for a six-year shadow budget um, went out the window, we're going to need more than that. And in fact, we're going to need even more than that. Um, you can see that this was going to be if we kept up with the red line, but here we were not projecting to be keeping up with that red line. If you follow that out, we're looking at more like another year out here. Now we're in really big trouble um, because I told you we're not going to get a fourth no-cost extension, but this would have put us well into a third no-cost extension. Um, so things weren't looking great, and then they got worse. So two months later, um, COVID hits, recruitment's halted, study visit canceled. So anyone who was involved with clinical research um, in early 2020 experienced this. Um, for the most part, anything other than um, you know, clinical trials that involve very serious life-threatening diseases, cancer, and so forth, things like that, anything else was put on hold um, uh, or canceled. Um, so that's what happened to us. We had been recruiting along here, and that was then stopped. But we were pretty far into this. We didn't want to kill the trial. Um, how are we going to deal with it? So there's two problems. One is that we were even further behind on recruitment because we had to stop recruiting. And COVID-19 tanked our primary outcome. What I mean by that is what I showed you before, we need these children to be getting sick, unfortunately. We're anticipating that children in the placebo arm are gonna have wheezing, lowertory, respiratory illnesses. Um, and we know what happened with COVID. Um, this is published more recently, but this is what we had, this is what was going on back then. So this is prevalence. These are various um, viral illnesses. <clears throat> Um, rhinoviruses, the tan here, that's one of the big ones. You can see that these are seasonal. I'm sure we all have experiences with that. Um, especially in the fall, um, and especially with children, um, they go back to school, they start catching colds, and um, and they get sick. So this was sort of the normal pattern of, um, of viruses uh, in 2019. Coming into early 2020, um, here's where we are in March. So we were anticipating a slow summer. Um, that's what always happens. But what we didn't know is what's going to happen going forward. 
what's going to happen as um, um, past early and mid 2020. <clears throat> Obviously, it knocked our um, our viruses out almost completely uh, out here in July. We were expecting them to come up, but they went down immediately due to all of the um, behavioral practices that were put into place. Children were taken out of school for um, you know the rest of the school year for 2020. Many children didn't go back to school in the fall of 2020. Now, since then, things have recovered, um, but it's still not back, still not back to normal. So this is showing out here 2022. We're out here now. So viral illnesses have come back after the pandemic, but they're still not back to what they were. The pattern isn't what it used to be before. So as of September 18th, 2020, um, we had to go to the Data Safety Monitoring Board for Orbex and um, talk to them about whether this trial could be completed or not. So because of the nature and the design of the trial, there was no interim efficacy analysis planned. Um, <clears throat> I think this makes sense because by the time you had finished all of your recruitment, um, um, you still would have a lot of data to collect. So by the time there was enough data to do an interim efficacy analysis, recruitment would already be done. So there would be no point in sort of trying to stop the study early for uh, efficacy. So that wasn't planned. However, the protocol did allow for <clears throat> informal investigations that um, might result in changes to the sample size or stopping the study. Um, if things looked either infeasible or futile, that is if it became clear that the, the study was not gonna be achievable um, um, with, the, with the design. So you saw that we were in big problems of feasibility because we were unable to recruit and we didn't know when we were gonna be able to recruit again. So as of September, uh, clinical research was still on hold. Um, <clears throat> So let's go back a little bit and talk about what those power curves actually meant. So I had showed you before that that was the power curve with 926 um, children randomized. It turns out that in survival analyses, it's not the number of children that matter. What matters is the number of events that occur. So what we needed was 225 WLRI events to occur. If, if we had a very high rate of events that could happen in 300 children, that would be great. That's all you would need. So it's not the number of children that matters so much, it's the number of events that occur. Um, and so we were projecting <clears throat> based on um, the anticipated effect size and the anticipated placebo um, uh, WLRI rate um, that we would get 225 first WLRI events um, by the end of the study. So we anticipated that over 760 child years of follow-up. So we had 926 children being randomized. We assumed there would be some loss of follow-up children would leave the study. So we assumed that 760 child years of follow-up would be observed. So not all of those kids would do the entire one year follow-up. Uh, to date, that is as of September 2020, 154 child years had been completed, but only 14 events had occurred. Um, and at that rate, <clears throat> we would have anticipated only 69 of events occurring by the end of the trial. So 0.9 events per child year is much, much less than the 0.43 originally anticipated. Right, so 0.9 would be off the charts down here. Power is gonna be very, very low if that, um, if that 0.9 is maintained. And that's what I mean when I say, um, that COVID really tanked our primary outcome. So all 14 of those events occurred during the 92 child years um, that were accrued before March 20. There were no wheezing episodes um, between March 2020 and September 2020 um, because of largely because of the public response to the COVID pandemic, kids staying home from school and staying home from um, daycare and other sorts of things like that. So if the WLRH were to return to pre-pandemic rates beginning in 2021, which we were hopeful for, um, then we would project 88 first events would have occurred by the end of the trial. That's not going to do it. We were needing 225 events to have 85% uh, power. 88 is not nearly enough. So in fact, the power would be 0.46. 46% power is unacceptably low. That study is not fundable. It's futile or infeasible, it can't go on. Um, so what are we gonna do? 
What are the solutions to that? Well, one solution is to just stop the trial and, and not complete it at all. Um, nobody wants that. There's already been a lot of money invested. There's a lot of children who and families who've you know, been exposed to an experimental drug um, with the understanding that there was going to be some good that came out of that research, um, that we would learn something. So just stopping the trial at that point would be a huge loss. So what are the other solutions? Well, one is to change the design so that the expected number of events is closer to 225, um, or just change the outcome to something that's less stringently defined that's gonna occur more frequently. So rather than say that these kids need to get serious, significant lower respiratory illnesses that cause wheezing, maybe we should just say that they need to catch any old cold, something much more uh, frequent. Um, that was thought to be just too great a scientific compromise. The whole point you remember the, the graph I showed you of the atopic march? The whole idea behind this, this study design is that there are significant respiratory illnesses and that's what we need to prevent. So just changing the outcome to something that's going to occur more often is not helpful because we don't anticipate our treatment working that way. So changing the design to get the expected number of events closer to 225. We first compromised and said, let's just try to get 200. That won't be 85% power. That'll be 80% power, which NIH is still okay to live with. With the current one-year follow-up design that we had, that was going to require 2,000 children. We were, we were around um, you know, 780, as I showed you on the curve when this, when this happened. Um, alternatively, we could keep the sample size that we had of 926, but just extend the follow-up. So rather, <clears throat> another way to get more events to happen is just to watch the kids for longer. So as I mentioned, what really matters is child years of observation. So you can get more children for one year, um, or you can get fewer children for more years. Um, so that was the other idea, was to keep the study design in terms of follow-up one year and add a lot more kids, or keep the same number of kids um, and extend the follow-up from one year to two and a half years. We also thought two and a half years is sort of an odd number. How about three years of follow-up? Uh, we can get the same amount of exposure time with three years of follow-up with only 800 kids. Um, that's a nice number because 800 is where we were. 2000 was deemed not achievable, that's not doable. So we could do 926 with two and a half years um, or 800 kids with three years. Uh, in either case, the study was gonna be completed by the end of 2026. but for far less cost, because it's cheaper to follow a child for more time than it is to recruit and treat an additional child and follow them for less time. So that was the solution we came up with, change our sample size to 800 and change the follow-up time from being a one-year follow-up to being three years of follow-up. Study is now gonna be completed by the end of 2026. That was very convenient because as I showed you our curve before, in September of 2020, remember I told you that Recruitment was stopped during COVID. So March, 2020, no more recruitment. We had to stop recruiting. That went all the way until um, the end of the summer before we could start recruiting again. <clears throat> we were very close to our 800 at that point. We could finish our 800 by the end of 2020, five years of study, two years on treatment, three years on follow-up gets us to the end uh, of 2025 or early 2026. So here's the revised power curves under a three-year follow-up. We kept our same effect size, our same hazard ratio of 0.66. That's we're looking for bronchovaxim to result in a 33% reduction in lower respiratory illnesses. Um, and now we're anticipating a much lower um, hazard in the placebo group. So we're now allowing for 0.15, and that's what we had calculated uh, based on our own data. So rather than you know, relying on the Tucson respiratory study, which was very many years old and also in Tucson. Um, this is now based on, on data from our own, our own trial and we feel much more confident about that. So what's the catch here? Um, N equals 800 with three years of follow-up. Well, one that's gonna increase the cost by $4 million, which we don't have. Um, we had our little shadow budget that was gonna allow us to finish within two no-cost extensions. Um, now we're gonna need five no-cost extensions. The grant's a five-year grant. So we've taken a five-year grant and adding a whole other five years to it. That, as I've mentioned before, is not something the NIH is gonna get behind. They're also not gonna give us just more money. The grant was for $5 million. They're not gonna give us another four. 
um, just because of this. So how are we gonna make this work? So we proposed um, an interim futility analysis or call it a gate uh, beyond which that we would proceed only with um, increased confidence about the success of the trial. <clears throat> we thought the NIH and the DSMB could get behind that. Um, and in fact, they did. So they needed to agree um, that we could use the NIH funds to get us to that gate and that if we got past the gate, OM Pharma, which is the company that makes the drug that I mentioned, this Broncovaxim, they're also providing the drug for us um, to use in the study. This is not something we could make ourselves. So they provided the drug for us. We also wanted them to give us $4 million to finish the study. Um, if this works, that would be a bargain for them. If we can show that their drug prevents primary wheezing and could eventually prevent asthma, that would be huge. That would be a bargain for them at $4 million if it could work. So they agreed to that as well. So we put a gate in there, meaning that we would not, we would only go to three no cost extensions and then we would do our futility analysis. If that failed at that point, we would stop the study. And that would then be okay because at that point, you know, ethically, the study was not gonna be successful. So there's sort of really not necessarily any point in going on with it. Um, so when are we gonna do that futility analysis? Well, as I told you, we were expecting 200, 200 WRIs to have occurred by the end of the study. We're gonna do the futility analysis when there have been 150. That's when we're gonna see how things are looking. Um, we're also gonna do that no earlier than when the last randomized child completes the two years of treatment. <clears throat> The good thing there is that means all children, if there is a benefit of the drug, all the children are going to get the full benefit. They're all going to get the two years of treatment. So no child is going to be, um, you know, is going to lose out on a treatment that might have helped them. It's also going to be no later than when the last randomized child completes the one year follow up, which was the original study design. So we're still going to achieve at worst, our original study design, that's gonna also take us through the second no-cost extension, um, which is when you know, we anticipated running out of money anyways. So why should the DSMB support this plan? Well, as I mentioned, it's got minimal ethical considerations because all the children are gonna get all of the treatment that's, that's there. So if there's any benefit, they're gonna get it. Um, we can also get to the lower limit without any additional funds. So NIH is not being asked to contribute any additional money. And we impose the upper limit to protect against the possibility that the rates would not increase as much as we expected, as the things could be even worse than we expected post COVID. And the OM Pharma um, will get this, you know, we're only asking them to commit to $2 million up front. They won't have to give us the other $2 million until we get past that gate, until we sort of show that this study is not futile. So how do we actually make this work? Um, we're running a little bit of time, so I'm gonna skip that. So how do, uh, if you're familiar with these, um, what are the operating characteristics of a futility analysis? So what's shown here is something that we decide, something called the critical value. So a futility analysis um, is done by uh, looking at the data, actually looking at the data according to the treatment group, doing the primary analysis outcome and calculating essentially a p-value, not exactly a p-value, basically sort of looking at what's the observed effect size um, when there've been 150 events, knowing that we're gonna eventually see 200. So there's, we can look at this as the probability of stopping. So the, uh, if we set the critical value very low, <clears throat> um, we talk about this in conditional power and predictive power, um, predictive power is sort of a Bayesian flavor of conditional power. Basically what it comes down to is you say, okay, Given what we've seen to date in the first 150 events, um, if, the, if we pass the critical value here, then what's the probability of stopping? So if you set the critical value at zero, then you're guaranteed to not stop, basically saying anything goes. Um, if you set the critical value, say, at 0 0.5, which means we want the conditional power to be at least 50%, then the chances of stopping are about 20%. I've highlighted here what the profile looks like under the target placebo hazard rate and under the target effect size. So if the trial does actually, if the drug does actually work with the effect size of hazard ratio 0.67 or a 33% reduction in, in the event rate, um, uh, this is what the profile looks like. If the treatment's even better than we thought, say 0 0.6, a 40% reduction, um, then the probability of stopping you know, becomes lower. If the treatment's not working at all, 
um, let's say it's only a 5% reduction, then for any given uh, critical value, you're much more likely to stop. And that's what's supposed to happen. If the hazard ratio is 0 0.95, then it's really sort of futile to, to continue this trial looking for a 33% reduction rate. It's not going to happen. It's too late. Um, so what's often looked at here is what's that feudal probability? What is that? That's what we're showing there with the um, with that. But you know we don't just have to look at the interim analysis. This is a simulation study. <clears throat> we could also project out what have, would have happened in a final analysis if we had finished the study all the way out. So we did this simulation um, um, to show what would have happened in the final analysis if we if we went all the way out. So what could happen? Let's say the final analysis here. Um, rejected the null. Um, that's what's the probability then of rejecting the null hypothesis at the end of the study? That's the definition of power. If you fail to reject the null hypothesis at the end of the study, that's a type two error. Um, so that's the complement of power. So if, if the final analysis resulted in rejecting the null, um, but we stopped it, but our decision was to stop it, that's a false negative. What I mean by that is our futility analysis was a false negative. Um, we said it was negative, we stopped the study, but that was actually wrong, it was gonna work. Um, the false positives would mean that the study was gonna fail at the end, um, <clears throat> um, but we continued it anyway, that would be a false positive. What we wanna do actually is maximize the true positives and the true negatives. That's what we should really be interested in when we're talking about these operating characteristics. So now I've re-shown those graphs with these operating characteristics. The x-axis here is still the critical value, which is something we determined. The y-axis is now is the total probability of doing the right thing. That's the, that's the solid line here. That's the true positives plus the true negatives. The bigger dashed line is the true positives. The light dashed line is the true negatives. So uh, in the scenario where the, where the medicine actually works, that's under our alternative hypothesis, of a hazard ratio of 0 0.66, um, we're much more likely to be getting true positives, right? Because we're showing that the study works. Um, um, on the other hand, if the study does not work, or if the treatment does not work and the true hazard ratio is only 0 0.95, then we're looking at the dashed lines. These are actually gonna be true negatives because the trial really isn't working. Um, but our overall probability of doing the right thing is what I wanna focus on and that's these solid lines. And again, the predictive and the conditional power are just two slightly different flavors of, of the same thing. Um, and this is what we took to the data safety monitoring group. So what we had proposed was that we would use the, um, uh, the predictive power, which is the Bayesian approach and set the critical value of 0 0.3. And under our anticipated hazard ratio of a 33% reduction and under the anticipated placebo hazard of 0 0.15, um, our futility analysis would do the right thing about 85% of the time. Now, one thing I want to note here um, is that if you set the critical value to zero, which means that you just, it doesn't matter what the results are, you go on. That's what critical value would say was zero. I mean, you, you go ahead. Um, then the probability of doing the right thing at the end is 0 0.8, and that is the definition of a true positive, and that's the power of the study design. Remember, I said that the power of the study is 0 0.8. Um, so we were locked in here, which was going to do the right thing about 85% of the time um, here. Now, if the treatment was working even better than we guessed, if the hazard ratio was 0 0.6, then the probability of doing the right thing um, would be greater than 90%. If the treatment didn't work at all uh, or worked very little, um, then the probability of doing the right thing would still be greater than 0.8. So we had we had come up with a scenario where the probability of doing the right thing with our interim analysis was always at least um, 0 0.8. And the probability of doing the wrong thing, um, that would be our false negative. We really wanted to avoid stopping the study if it really worked. Um, that would be pretty unlikely. Not impossible, but unlikely. Um, as you can see here, it really doesn't make much difference. You need to choose a different critical value if you want to use the conditional power approach as opposed to the Bayesian approach. You need a different value, but you're getting the same, um, you're getting pretty close to the same um, success rates for both ones. They're just at different places. So different shaped curves, but you can still hit the same um, success rate for both of them if you choose an appropriate critical value for them.
Um, what if things go better than expected? What if the placebo hazard rate is better than 0 0.15? What if it's 0 0.25? Um, well, then things look even better. Probability of doing the right thing um, <clears throat> is greater than 0.9 um, for where we anticipate it to be. Um, it's interestingly um, behaves differently out here. And this is one of the reasons why we decided to go with the um, the Bayesian, the Bayesian approach rather than the frequentist approach was that if things are going badly, we have a better chance of doing the right thing out here of stopping the study when it should be stopped. Uh, are folks still hearing me? My screen has just gone funny here. Yes, we hear you loud and clear. Okay. And the... Um, the screen is still showing too? Uh, yes, averaging across most likely placebo hazard Great. rates. Great, thank you. Um, so that's where the Bayesian approach, the uh, predictive power approach um, 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 can show some advantage. Um, that. So lessons learned, we did a lot of work on this, figuring this out, coming up with a plan that the, the um, uh, that the DSMB and the NIH were very happy with. In March of this year, we got OM Pharma to agree to provide the full $4 million without any interim analysis at all. So um, we quickly canceled that order um, and the DSMB was okay with it. So we had, the, we had the interim analysis approved, ready to go. OM Pharma agreed that they would give us the $4 million. They didn't like having any chance, as I get, I mentioned, this could be huge for them if it actually worked. So they they really um, were okay with eliminating the possibility of any, um, of any false positives. Um, so they agree the full $4 million. So this study is now gonna go to the end uh, without any interim futility analysis. Um, you know, I've come to believe as, a, as an academic that, um, um, time spent thinking is never time spent wasted, or it's never time wasted. Um, uh, so in some ways, it was bittersweet, um, you know, that all of that work and planning that we did uh, was totally unnecessary. Uh, on the other hand, it's obviously a big relief to have that money in place and have the commitment to finish the project in place. So those are my, um, those are my, uh, those are my lessons learned. Um, I guess you could say that it was a, uh, I got I got let off the hook at the end, um, and I definitely had mixed feelings about uh, about not being able to do the the um, futility analysis that we spent so much time working on. Uh, but I think you know there was there was no obviously no way for us to turn that down. Um, you know if the company wants to see this trial all the way through, um, you know, it's the right thing to do uh, to continue it. I think yeah that is the uh, that's the last slide. Um, so that's it, Terry. I think I'm right up against my five o'clock. I, I great. Yeah, I yes. So, time, but I, I'm willing to stay on it. Um, uh, so, so it is five p.m. And so, anyone who has a commitment, feel free to go. Uh, those of you who have a few minutes, uh, you're welcome now to submit questions via chat, which I will read out loud. Or you're also welcome to just uh, unmute yourself and. Uh, could come out with questions right away. Um, Dave, if, if I may start, um, yeah, I wanted to make sure. So you did this, it looked like a very thorough, sophisticated futility analysis. And uh, the DMSB was happy, uh, NIH was happy, uh, but I guess that, that your corporate partner, when they looked at that, uh, they said, it's worth $4 million to us to avoid any risk of a false positive, right? Right, so they, they did not wanna have the chance that we could take a successful trial and kill it early because we didn't have $2 million. That for them was wow. just not, not, um, not viable. And I can understand that, you know, if, if there's a way to prevent childhood asthma, um, and obviously it's not gonna be a, not gonna be a, a total, uh, you know, a, it's not going to be a vaccine like, uh, you know, that's 98% success. But, you know, we were looking to cut the risk by 33%. If, if you could do that, um, that would be a, a moneymaker for them. 
what what strikes me is as you emphasized in the beginning so much of what you shared with us today is actually managing it's like managing a business you've got budgets uh you've got deadlines and then you have these calamities like a pandemic which which throw everything uh into chaos and uh, i remember when i started graduate school one of my mentors said the most important thing about research is to be flexible um and uh i'm thinking wow you guys had to be so flexible and responsive and creative um and these these are things that are not taught in graduate school um and, and yet uh, as as i said in the beginning you have huge sums of money, uh, years of person effort. Uh, so this, it's just a giant enterprise and the skills you've shown us are so, so important. Uh, it, what would you say to anyone who's considering a multi-site trial, uh, you know, to think about? So um, the thought of this is changing at NIH. Um, the trial that I mentioned earlier on that Lan and I are working on, NIH is now requiring many cases a feasibility analysis before they even let you start. So um, we're actually launching this trial within the next month, I think, um, that Lan and I are working on. And not we, but the trial as a group, the network as a group has to show that they can recruit for this trial in a timely fashion. And if we fail to recruit for that study over the first four months, they will not fund the rest of the trial. So the NIH is now, um, you know, setting things up to, um, you know, set up gates early on so that they don't, they don't like being in this position any more than anybody else because it's very common in clinical research for re for recruitment to take longer than it's supposed to for any numbers of reasons. Um, um, so NIH is taking, you know, a new approach, uh, not, not brand new this year, but you know, compared to 10, 20 years ago. Um, uh, of, of requiring studies to do this. That puts the onus on the investigators to make sure they're lined up, ready to go early on. Um, uh, so that I, I guess is one of the one of the more recent changes is this idea of sort of a two-stage funding process to really show that you can complete the research on time very early on in the process, opposed to just sort of um, you know going along. As you saw in the graph I showed, by the time we got to the point that it became clear we weren't going to make it, we were already three and a half years into the project. Um, and at that point, NIH is locked in. Um, you know, it's, it's going to be hard for them to recruit the money that they've already that they've already dedicated to the project. The time that's already gone to the project becomes very hard for them to kill a project at that point, um, even if it's very far behind. Um, so that that I think has been the so the biggest um, change that I've seen over the last few few years that people need to worry about. Okay, so you're you're emphasizing that there should be some real hard thought about the feasibility and the and the achievability of a of your recruitment schedule. Yeah, that's what makes the grant writing so interesting because grant reviewers are scientists, um, you know, not um, not budget people. Um, and so when you write a grant, you want the research to be, you know, sexy, interesting. You want to show that you're going to come up with, um, you know, with, with a great trial design. This really has a, a chance to impact, um, you know, public health. Um, and that's what people focus on is sort of how can you make the trial as attractive as possible um, and as cheap as possible to get the NIH to fund it. Um, um, so, you know, it's hard to write a grant. <laughs> Um, that focuses on the mundane practical things. So that's one of the lessons that we've learned is, is um, now that NIH is sort of changing their approach to funding these projects, they're also changing the, their approach to reviewing these grants. And it's much more important to come in with, you know, not just why is this a great study? How is this medicine going to work? What is the power of our study design? What is the, how great is our statistical analysis plan? Um, but now it's all about, can you really do this? How many hospitals do you have lined up to do this recruitment? What are the catchment areas for all these different hospitals? You know, are those patients out there? Do they exist? What sort of approaches are you going to use to recruit them? Um, that's what's now, you know, is at least important as a grant application um, as it is sort of the, you know, the science of it. Um, I, I don't, I welcome anyone 
Uh, we've lost most of our folks. Uh, um, I encourage anyone to unmute and ask a question. I'll ask just one more, Dave, and then I'll I'll stop bothering you. But um, were there any ethical concerns? You know, uh, you know, the the best way to do this is for the NIH, this neutral party, to fund the science. And because of COVID and other reasons, uh, you had this shortfall, financial shortfall. And so the company has a vested interest. Um, were, was there any discussion about that? Yeah, so um, NIH talks out of both sides of its mouth on this a lot. Um, you know, this partnering with, um, with pharma or anybody, any, any sort of, um, you know, private companies. They, the government likes sort of this idea of saying that they're going to partner with um, with these companies so that the taxpayers aren't sort of you know bearing the full burden of all this research you know because it's the company that's going to benefit right so if NIH spends all this money and shows this trial oh and farm is the ones who's going to make money on this that, I mean, obviously there's going to be a lot of people out there that's going to improve public health which is what NIH is about but you know they're spending a lot of this money so that pharma can make even more money um, um, so that, you know, that's NH's government, I think, sort of talked about those partnerships. On the other hand, though, it may be what you're hinting at is that once you start allowing the company to fund the project, you run into questions about conflict of interest. Um, um, and that's one of the reasons that NIH funds this kind of research in the first place. Um, you know, because you could just say, well, why don't we let OM Pharma do this trial, pay their own way to do this, and then take it to the FDA. Um, um, <clears throat> So yeah, no, that was a difficult conversation. Typically, you know, NIH does not like to have research funded by the people who are going to make money on it. It's just a conflict of interest that doesn't look good. So although they like you know, the idea of partnerships, when it actually comes to the nitty gritty of it, um, you know, the, the people get uncomfortable. Now, this is only, as I mentioned, this is a total, almost a $30 million project that NIH is putting in. So OM Farm is putting up $4 million. You know, that's not... That's still a, you know, that's not, um, that's you know, 4 million out of the total 34 that it's gonna cost. So they're chipping in, but they're definitely not sort of taking over the project. And that was the other part of it too, is that this $4 million had to be um, a gift. That is, there's no strings attached to that $4 million. Um, that was one of the requirements of the NIH for that deal is that it was a no strings attached. So pharma doesn't get any, it's not like we're gonna give them um, you know, anything at the end of this trial, we're just going to finish the trial using their money. Right. And uh, I'm sure they got some kind of tax write-off. Um, oh, actually, they're, uh, that OM Pharma is a European company. So I don't, I'm, I don't know what the deals, uh, what the deal oh, is. Oh, okay. I, I don't know okay. what the issues work, you know, with now we've got foreign, foreign companies supporting our research. Fortunately, I didn't have to deal with those contracts that went somewhere else, but. Um, yeah. Okay, well, Dave, thank you so much for sharing all your insight and experience. Uh, it, it always makes me think we're always taught that clinical trials are the gold standard. And yet when you look under the hood, you see there's so much change sometimes that you have to deal with uh, that it's, it's not easy. It's very hard. Yeah, no, you're exactly right, Terry. And this was not something that I was trained for 25 years ago. It's um, learned on the job. Okay, last chance for someone to chime in. If not, uh, thank you so much, Dave. And I hope you have a great holiday season. And thanks again for sharing with us today. Thanks, Terry. Thanks, everyone.